Welcome everyone. I see you stand. We're so glad that you're here today, whether you're here in the room with us or online. I ask that you just join in worship with us. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me. Chapter 2, verse 9. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. This verse is packed with amazing truth that you were chosen, chosen to be a priest, a royal priest. And what God wants for this holy nation is for us to declare the praises of the God who has set us free tonight. Amen? And let's sing this boldly to him tonight. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Sing this out. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am, and I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am, and you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am, and I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am, and you are for me. 
Amen. You know why I love that song? It serves for me as a solid reminder of how often I need a reset in my relationship with God. I don't know about the rest of you, but I find in my relationship with him, I can quickly move toward viewing him as the God who solely provides what I need, which is not a bad thing, but I can get sucked almost entirely into what can God do for me? God, I need healing. Or I have this need in my life, will you provide? Or some sort of situation that I'm not sure how to get through it, Lord, would you provide me some direction? What can you give, give, give? What can I receive over and over and over? Which is not a bad thing. But that is not all who God is. He is much, much more than that, as that song declares. He is the one who sets our identity. We are who he says we are. He has chosen us. He has not forsaken us. He loves us deeply. And that song resets that for me. He is not just who, it's not just about what can we get from God, but who is God. And as we continue to worship, this next song will offer some of those same sentiments. Because I'm not sure why you are here this evening or why you are joining us online. We're glad that you're here. And often we come in for really good reasons. And often those are things we can get from God. And we're going to the right source. It's a great start. But with everything we need, for all the reasons we worship, for all the reasons we show up, let's not focus just on the blessings that we're hoping for, the gifts that he has given us. Let's not miss the blesser. Let's not miss the gift giver. Let's turn our attention for why we have gathered to our loving Father. Let's keep worshiping together.
heart of love be welcomed in this place. And from the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, you lifted me up. How great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me Step down to earth in a sudden perfection. You gave your life for us, and we are amazed. Oh, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, oh, how great is your love.
Would you pray with me tonight? Father, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to be here and to gather as your church. And we come before your throne through the blood of your son, Jesus, who's made a way for us to come boldly before your throne of grace to receive both grace and mercy in time of need. And Father, we thank you that you calm our anxieties, that you silence the voices in our heads, that you speak the word to us, peace, be still. And so Lord, in this moment, wherever we are, Father, we just welcome the ministry of your spirit to our hearts and our lives to remind us of what you've done for us, Lord. Lord, I sometimes I think, Father, we sing these songs and we lose that amazement and that wonder. Father, that we've been saved by the power of the cross. <laughs> that God, you have delivered us as we celebrated in scripture tonight from the domain of darkness and you brought us into your marvelous light, God. God, would you open our eyes? Sometimes we come to worship so blind, Father, because life just has this way of putting blinders on us, Father. We just pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you just lift those blinders, that your spirit would awaken us in this place tonight. And then we could really see how amazing this salvation that we've received from you really is. So God, thank you, Father, for the ministry of your spirit, for what it is you wanna do in our hearts tonight, Father. We welcome you and ask your blessing. We just sing that chorus, How Great Is Your Love, one more time. How great, how great. God, open our eyes in this place in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for just giving us that hunger, even in times we don't feel like it, Lord for just causing us to hunger and thirst for you. So God, would you stir that hunger in our hearts, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Let's give it up for the worship team tonight, come on. Well, hey everyone, my name's Jason Parker, and I'm the campus pastor at Coastal Church, which is your Barrington campus up in Barrington. And I'm really thankful to have the opportunity tonight to share from God's Word. And I was talking to actually a couple people in the back row, that were in the back row, and then Dave made everyone move up a little bit, but they were in the back row, and I was just, we were just talking about God's Word, and how just God just, I love talking about God's Word. I love having conversations about God's Word. I love just praying about God's Word. I just love God's Word. And so I'm really thankful to have opportunity to share tonight, because I love talking about God's Word. And so that's kind of what preaching is. And so that's kind of where we're going tonight. We're going to dive into God's Word, and I kind of want to like I want to really build off of what AJ talked about last Sunday. We were kind of in Matthew chapter 9, and so if you're online last week joining with us, we welcome you here tonight, um, and it's going to just be a follow-up from, from last week. And we're going to go, actually go back to Matthew chapter 9. But before we get there, um, I was reading this week in my devotions. I don't know how many of you have participated with the Version Bible plan that we're doing across our three campuses, um, the 60-day New Testament challenge. So that was really helpful for my own devotional life. I needed some kind of set rhythms, so it's been a real answer to prayer for me to kind of stay regularly in the Scriptures. And this past week, I read in Revelation chapter 3, and something that I read there really struck the last time I hosted here at YDBC, um, because I was talking last time I hosted about how I feel like the pandemic, in large part, has kind of lulled us into like a spiritual sleep. And we've kind of lost sight of the vision that God has for us and how God actually wants to wake us up. And then in my devotions yesterday, I was reading the message that um, the church in Sardis actually got um, here in Revelation chapter 3. And I want to read this again because I, f- I still feel like God's trying to say that. And so let's kind of look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. It says, wake up, right? Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. 
So I'm reading my devotions this week, and I was like, whoa, Lord, this is exactly what I sense you were saying back then. And, in, and to some degree, I still feel like the Lord is saying it right now. He's saying, wake up. Because, and in particular in that passage of Scripture, it says, your deeds are what? Unfinished. In other words, there's still work left to do. The job isn't done yet. Now, God has given us an amazing mission and mandate that is so crystal clear, and I love it, okay? <laughs> Taking Jesus into every community in Sao West Nova. Like, that vision has got me captivated. Like, I just truly believe that is from the Lord for us across our region. Can I get an amen? Come on, guys. Can I get an amen? That's what I'm talking about. Come on. Our vision is to take Jesus into every community in Sao West Nova. Now, most of us in this room would say that hasn't happened yet, right? We still have some unfinished, but I'm seeing some head nods. That's good. Amen. So God wants us to actually, like the scripture says here, remember what we've received, and this is the vision that we've received, and hold it fast. And what we find here with the church in Sardis, there was actually consequences to not finishing the job. And God has given us a vision to take Jesus in every community in Sao West Nova. And there's consequences if we don't finish the job. And that sounds really heavy. And I think we do need to feel the weight of that to some degree. And the consequences, the, one of the biggest consequences is like people actually won't get to hear this life-giving message we have called the gospel. And that would be a shame. Lives will not get transformed if we don't continue to finish the job that God has called us to as a church. Because people really matter to God. You know, and there's lots of different reasons why we don't finish jobs. You ever ask your spouse or your children to do something? Doesn't get done? Like, put that cup away. Doesn't happen. Clean up the puzzle. Pick up your clothes off the floor. I, and I, I can say that about my children, but I am notoriously bad for not finishing jobs. And here's why. This is my confession to you. I really love dreaming about what if and big ideas. And I really love rallying people to an idea and a cause. Like, let's go do this. Yeah! But after we get to that point, like getting into the weeds and doing administration and dot, making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, that ain't my thing. Because <laughs> I spend all of my resources dreaming and galvanizing. And I'm not really that person that takes things to the 100-yard line. Because I spend all my resources on the other. It's why in my house that we bought, in my office, the light switches and plugs aren't screwed back onto the wall. It's why in my house, the curtains are not present on a lot of my windows. Because I'm in my house and I'm happy and I've spent all my energy on that. And I don't feel like I have the resources to actually get the job done. I really want the job done. But at times I feel like I don't have the resources to get the job done. And here's the deal. God has clearly given us a job to do that's unfinished. Can we be on the same page with that? Can I get an amen for that one? God has clearly given us a job to do, and that job is actually unfinished. We have yet to take Jesus in every community in Sao Nova. And I think this is what happens. You individually look at your resources, your time, your talent, and your treasure— and you look at that big mission statement, which is amazing and, and of God, and you're thinking, man, I actually don't have the resources to see that vision fulfilled. Let me take it a step further. I think when we stack up our two soon-to-be three campuses and look at taking Jesus in every community in South West Nova, and we stack up all of our resources of time, talent, and treasure, I still think our math is a little bit off. Because we do an inventory of what we have at our three campuses, and we're like, man— there's still more needs. There's still way more hurting and harassed people we learned about in Matthew chapter 9 that we don't have the capacity to meet right now. And I think that brings us to actually a right conclusion. I think that brings us to the point where we realize that we actually need God. That if we're going to fulfill the mission that God's given us, we actually need God's presence, which last week led us to do what? To pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. And we're going to go back for a second in Matthew chapter 9. Don't worry, I'm not going to re-preach AJ's message, but I want to build off of it to go somewheres, go to the next step. 
Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38 says this, And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So I love this passage of Scripture because to me this so reveals the heart of the Father for the hurting and the broken. And it reminds me, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel when all this were allowed to travel places, I so encourage you to go. I was there a couple years ago when I was doing my master's degree, and I remember being on the Sea of Galilee. I remember being out in a boat, being on the Sea of Galilee, and I remember looking into Capernaum, which was like Jesus' headquarters. And I actually walked in Capernaum where I was in the synagogue where Jesus literally healed someone. I was like, I was literally in the spot where Jesus healed someone, which is amazing. But I remember looking at Capernaum and looking at the mountains all around in the Sea of Galilee and looking at Bethsaida and all these communities that are talked about in the scripture. And I remember just seeing it. I saw Jesus with his, with his Holy Spirit entourage of disciples traveling from community to community, healing every sickness and every disease. And I was like, man, like I just seen Jesus traveling itinerantly doing this ministry, traveling from city to city, town to village, and seeing crowd after crowd after crowd. And every time he saw a crowd, huh. Oh, he was moved with compassion because he saw the people that were hurting and harassed. It wasn't just one crowd. It was crowd after crowd after crowd in every single community. And as A.G. talked about last week, Jesus was fully God, but he was fully human. He couldn't be in Jerusalem and Galilee at the same time. The needs were so great. What did Jesus instruct his disciples to do? Pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. But the kicker for me as I look at this passage of Scripture is the very next verse what happens. This is an instance where, like in your original, in the original Scripture, there was no chapter or verse marks. It was just all one big scroll. So you roll up the book of Matthew. So Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 happens immediately after Matthew chapter 9 verse 38, after who prayed for the workers of the harvest, the disciples. Right after that, this is what Jesus, this is what happens in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And he, and he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. So Jesus saw the needs, was moved with compassion, encouraged his disciples to pray for the Lord of the harvest, but then what happens? He actually empowers and commissions his disciples to do what? To go. I heard uh, someone share tonight about going south, and they weren't talking about Florida. And I love that, whatever that, where that came from, going south. Like, I love that sent language, because that is so the Spirit of God. That is so how God wants to work, talking about south church. I love that sending, moving, action, because that is so the heart of God. God is a missionary God. He is on mission, and he's asking us to join him on mission. Amen. So, so Jesus kind of sets the disciples up. Do you see it? Do you see how he sets them up? He's like, I want you to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the field. So they go ahead and pray as they go from crowd to crowd. And guess what happens as these disciples begin to pray? Jesus is like, you're the workers. Gotcha. I got you to pray. And now you're the workers, so now I'm going to empower you because you put yourself in a posture to actually receive my divine resources because you prayed, and I poured it into you now, and you can, be go, you can go and be sent by me. This, Jesus kind of like got his disciples. He's like, I'll get you to pray, not knowing that they'd be the sent ones. I find that so fascinating. Prayer prepares the workers. Jesus wanted his disciples to pr- pray because... They were about to become the workers that Jesus referred to. And I love the, the word that is in Matthew 10, verse 1. That's the very first word it says, and. It's like a continuation of the prayer we see in Matthew chapter 9. You see, Jesus got his disciples to pray because the needs of the hurting and the harassed needed a supernatural solution. It needed divine resources to get the job done. 
And so Jesus puts his disciples in a posture of prayer so they can actually receive the resources from heaven to actually go and meet the needs of the hurting and the harassed. Prayer prepares the workers. And you know what? God's strategy is still the same here today in 2021. God wants to put us in a posture of prayer so if the Father can download his heart, his passion, his love, his power, his gifts, and all these amazing heavenly resources that God wants to give. Why? So we can go out and minister to the hurting and the harassed. So we can actually go take Jesus into every community in Southwest Nova. So AJ last week got you all to pray. He kind of set you up like Jesus did, right? Because if you're praying for these people that you rub shoulders with every day in the communities in Southwest Nova— don't be surprised if God actually calls you to be the answer to your own prayer. Because you're the one in your prayer closet or in your prayer time or here at church that are interceding on the behalf of that person. Don't be surprised if God actually downloads in your heart the ability to minister to that person. Because that's God's strategy to actually reach the lost. That's what God's strategy was here in Matthew chapter 9 and 10. I was on Facebook today um, just looking at one of the Facebook posts that were made for Yarmouth Wesleyan. And I loved looking at what specific people were praying for. And there was a lot of prayers focused around healing and brokenness. And I just know that God wants to do that. God wants to heal people. He wants to fix what's broken inside of people. But then I got thinking about all those people that posted that and were praying into that end. And I thought, God actually wants to use those people that have that on their heart to actually often be the answer to their own prayers. Now, there's some situations where you're praying for a situation maybe overseas where God just calls you to pray. I'm not saying that every single time you pray for something, you're the answer. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying oftentimes, God wants to use you to answer your own prayer. Why? Because you're in the prayer closet. You're interceding on behalf of that person, and God is downloading his heart and his power and his love for those people or that people group or that community into who? Into you. God's pouring his goodness into you. He's pouring his resources into you. When, you, when you're having time in prayer, you're crying on behalf of the needs of the community. It's God, then in those moments, God downloads his resources to you. It's in the moments of intercession that God pours his passion into you for a community. It's at times of prayer that God pours his love into your hearts through the Holy Spirit, like it talks about in the book of Romans. It's times of prayer that God begins to break your heart for the things that break his heart. And the Bible actually teaches us that when we pray, when we draw near to God, when we're filled with the love of God, we're actually filled with the power of God. You see, prayer actually unlocks divine resources. Resources that we need to fulfill the mission. Paul says in his prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, 19, he says this, that you may experience the love of Christ, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God and the power that comes from him. We need to be filled with all the fullness of God and the power that comes from him. Why? So we can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. If we're going to fulfill the mission that God's given us, would you say that the mission God's given us is exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or imagine? I can't even fathom, like, seeing a gospel outpost, seeing every community in Southwest Nova reach. Like, that is, like, up here. But God said in Ephesians 3.20, it can happen. And how can it happen? Not just because he's God. No, it says he can do immensely more than we ask or imagine according to what? His power at work within us. God wants to use us to blow our minds with what he can do. But we need his resources. We need to be filled with the love of God. We need to be filled with his power so we can fulfill the mission, the mission and vision God's given us. You see, if we're going to see authentic life transformation, we need his power. We need his love. Because methods and strategies without the love of God do more harm than good. We need his supernatural power. That's why in Acts chapter 1, Jesus actually instructed his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. I just picture like, okay, guys, little huddle here. Don't mess this up because you will mess things up majorly, okay? Wait in Jerusalem, okay? Wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Then I will download into you power, love, gifts, passion, direction, prophecy, everything we see happen in the book of Acts. But just wait, 
Don't go out yet. Wait for me to download that stuff into you. Then you'll be ready to go. So what do the disciples do? They wait. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that they were doing what? They were constantly in prayer. And it's in that moment in Acts chapter 2 where they, the Holy Spirit was poured out and they were filled with the love of God, filled with the power of God, and then sent into mission to literally the four corners of the earth. And God does things the same way today. He brings us to a posture of prayer and waiting on him. And then God pours out his spirit onto us and sends us into mission to finish the job and gives us the resource so we can finish the job that God has given to us. See, something supernatural, and I know maybe that's not a fun word in, in our church world, but we need the supernatural power of God. We need it. And something supernatural happens when God pours out his spirit on his people. Gifts get deposited. Abilities get strengthened. Visions and dreams start to emerge. Passions increase. Compassion for specific groups get formed. People begin to feel called by God to certain groups and communities and strategic things. God begins to provide direction. And most importantly, Christ takes residence in our hearts. So he can work through us to those that we come in contact with. So why does God do all that? <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a lot. I mean, you send your only son to die on a cross. The thing that you value the most, you give that so this can all happen. I mean, Jesus came, suffered on the cross, rose again from the dead, ascended to the right hand of God, and then Jesus actually sends the Holy Spirit to do all this stuff. I mean, that sounds like so much work and what a price to pay. Why does God do all that? Because he loves people. He loves people so deeply. And prayer reveals this incredible truth and aligns the disciples and aligns our hearts with this truth. People actually matter to God. People matter to God. That's why we do what we do. That's why we're taking Jesus into every community in Southwest Nova is because people matter to God. And God's strategy hasn't changed. He wants to download his heart, his power, his love, his gifts, his character, his resources into who? Into you. So you can be a sent, commissioned vessel for God to use to take Jesus into every community in Southwest Nova. Can I get an amen? amen? You see, there are a few things more valuable to God than a changed life. I mean, that's why God sent Christ to die. It's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to fill the church. And it's why God's whole work of salvation is to see lives changed. Lives like my friend who came to Coastal a couple years ago. And he came, and I love hearing him tell a story now because he used to come to Coastal wearing like a, a, a white t-shirt. And he would leave Coastal after it's over, and he could wring his shirt out. He sweat so bad. He was like under such conviction from the Holy Spirit. And he ended up accepting Jesus. And then last, I think it was last winter, um, I was talking to his six-year-old son. And his six-year-old son came up to me and said, like, huh. I just can't believe how different my dad is. That's why we do what we do. That's why we take Jesus in every community of Southwest Nova, because changed lives matter. And Jesus changes lives. It's li lives like people who have sought counsel recently, who are totally at the end of themselves, that are struggling with mental crisis and they bow their hearts to receive Jesus. It's lives like the three people who accepted Christ at Coastal and this Sunday are getting baptized. That's why we do what we do. It's lives like that have been impacted through the ministry of CR and are literally experiencing transformation from the inside out. That's why we do what we do because change lives matter, Amen. It's the youth that have been mentored or invested and have yielded their life up to Christ. That's why we do what we do. It's the lives that will be transformed because of the ministry of South Church. And yes, it's going to cost something. Yes, it's going to be challenging, but we do that because changed lives matter. It's lives like the people that are in this room right now. Do you remember before you knew Jesus? Do you 
you remember the state that you were in. God brought you to your knees. You were so filled with sin and brokenness and emptiness, and you were searching so many places to fill that void. And you cried out to God and said, Father, please come into my life. And God met you where you're at. He poured his love into your life. He forgave you for your sin. He washed you clean. He poured his love into your life and gave you purpose and meaning. He literally transformed your life, which is why you're here tonight. Why you're singing when you don't feel like singing. Because you know what God has done in your behalf, amen. Changed lives matter to God. That is why we do what we do. And when God pours out his spirit, he gives you a passion for changed lives. A consuming passion, the thing that your mind is just bent on. Why? Because God's mind is bent on transforming lives. He is moved with compassion. He wants to heal and restore. And he wants to use us to do it. He wants to break our hearts for the things that break his but we need his resources because we can't get the job done by ourselves. There's so many more lives that God wants to transform, and he will. But we need him, and we need to be willing. We need to be willing to actually be the answer to our own prayers. Are you willing tonight? Are you willing to be an answer to the prayers you whisper to the Father? God will challenge you and say, be willing, surrender to me, because maybe I want to use you. Maybe I don't want to use the pastor. Maybe I want to use you. You know, I wish I could just turn a tap on tonight and God could pour the spirit on you and on me. But it doesn't work that way. God does what he wills. But this I know. When we begin to pray and intercede and seek God's face and hunger for him, we put ourselves in a position where God can actually pour out his spirit. I was telling Alex as we prayed tonight, I just want so bad for God to consume us. I want so bad for God to pour out his spirit on our lives, to fill us with his passion, to fill us with his power, to fill us with his gifts, to fill us with his abilities so we can go and fulfill the job that God has called us to do. So we can finish the job. I'm not interested in a flashy mission statement. I want to see people reach for the gospel. And the only reason I have that is because God's put that in my heart. I can't take any credit for that. God wants to give you an all-consuming passion for the things he's passionate about. So we can go and finish the job God's given us. But we need him. We need God to pour his spirit afresh. So I'm just wondering tonight, is that the cry of your heart? Do you want God to pour his spirit on you? Or maybe you're here tonight and you're hearing this hope of a transformed life and you've yet to accept Jesus Christ to come into your life. There's going to be an opportunity at the end of this service for you to say, Jesus, I need you to heal me and forgive me and restore me. I'm just going to pray. God, we need you to pour out your spirit on us. We see the needs in our communities in Southwest Nova and they were way bigger than us. We don't have what it takes, but we know you do. So prepare us, your workers. Download your heart into us and we be the hands and feet. Father, pour your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit so that you might heal and restore those we come in contact with. Lord, we wait on you to move. So have your way. And we ask again, pour out your spirit. Thoughts that burn with holy fear, purify.
strength in what remains. So we the church who bear your life, lamp of flame, a city bright, king and kingdom come is what we pray. And we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, so pour your Pour 
fragrance of heaven so pour your spirit out and pour your spirit out a holy anointing it's the power of your presence so pour your spirit out Have you noticed how so often the best things in life actually start out quite scarily? Proposing to someone you love. Becoming a parent. Jumping into a crystal clear, perfectly still pool of water. Blessings you know that are on the other side, but questions leading up to those things of what if uncertainty. How are you going to react? How's everything going to go? The scariest things, the most, the best things in life are so often scary. The kingdom of God is the best thing in life. To step into it is often unnerving. To take another step with Jesus, if you're already in it, is often unnerving. But here's what I know. Many of you have prayed this week, God, show me the way. Show me what you have for me. You are the Lord of the harvest. What do you have next for me? You have prayed. And I know full well he is prompting a lot of people and encouraging you along the way. But you're standing at the edge and wondering, what if? How will this go? I haven't done this before. And some of you perhaps have even heard this message tonight and you're thinking, yes, Jesus sounds pretty awesome. And I bet life with him is as such. But what if? And you're convinced that there are blessings toward your next step, but you are not sure how to take it or if you can do it? Let us serve you. One of the reasons the church exists is to help you take your next step. And so we're going to pray in a moment. But as you leave here, trusting that God is prompting many Many of you shouldn't be leaving these doors out into the parking lot before you stop by the Connection Center to talk to Esther. She would love to have a conversation with you about what is your next step. I'll also be lingering up front here. Any of the staff, we would love to talk with you because God is moving and we trust that your next step with Him holds greater blessing than you could imagine, holds more purpose, holds more value we could picture. If you're online and you're not in this room, we would still love for you to text the number. Just text the word next to the number you'll see here on your screen in just a moment. We would love to connect with you the same thing. We want to serve you, church. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are eternally good, eternally wise, and eternally capable. We ask from the ways that you stir, that you would grant courage in this place tonight and in these rooms where people are watching online, courage to take next steps toward you. You have not called us to know everything that's coming. You've simply called us to take your hand. God, perhaps there's even people uh, engaging in this room online who are ready. They're right at the edge choosing you in their life instead of everything they've ever known. God, I pray that you would help us. Help us to take that leap. It is a leap of faith, but God, you always reward a leap of faith. You never drop us. You never fail us. We sang it earlier. You never forsake us because we are your chosen. Lord, would you give us the ability and the desire to move toward you because the harvest is plentiful and you are calling more workers. 
Thank you, God, for your goodness that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being part of church tonight, everyone. Thank you being, for being part of church whenever you've been watching online. Really glad that you are here. If you want to give on the way out, you have been here enough times, you know how to do that by now. There's online options as well that you can eat transfer to on the screen. If tonight is your night for a next step, come and talk to us.